Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Luke's Sunday Forum. During December, we are focusing on the theme of wonder, and you just heard our own Elizabeth Remy Johnson, principal harpist of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, play I Wonder As I Wander. Couldn't be a better way to introduce this wonder-filled guest I have today, my deep, closest, newest friend in Atlanta, <laughs> Lois. So magnificent. Welcome, Lois Reitzes. Why, thank you. And uh, what a delight to follow Elizabeth's exquisite playing. She is an amazing musician, and we're so lucky to have her with us in the Atlanta Symphony. We truly are. Everyone, if you have just heard Elizabeth Wright's, I mean, sorry, Lois Wright's voice for the first time, you are, I welcome you to what my wife and I consider to be the voice of wonder on public radio. My, my wife said, oh, I'm so excited. Please tell Lois writes us every time she comes on the radio, my soul smiles. So oh. Lois, oh, Lois, I could say all sorts of things. Uh, and I should say that your uh, program is City Lights and you have this amazing way of giving us to your listening audience. Um, a kind of a review of all of the wonderful things that are going on in the arts in Atlanta. And you've been with WABE for quite a number of years. And we are in the hands of a genius and a veteran and someone who is, in my mind, walking wonder. So, Lois, I'm just really thrilled that you're here. Thank you. I am thrilled to be here. And when you asked me back for year two of wonder, it was especially remarkable to think about how this year is different from all others. And that's why you wanted to have our topic for wonder be centered around the pandemic this year. Yes. Yes. I, so Ms. Reitz, Lois Reitzes has just referred to last year's conversation we had. And I want you all to go to our website and go to the archives and listen to that because it was itself an amazing experience. And she has generously uh, kind of appraised what we're doing then by sending us clips and our agenda is to listen to some things that she has kind of been struck by wonder yes. during the pandemic. And, uh, that is to, to give testimony to have the power of wonder. No matter what we're, what we're experiencing, um, wonder still comes to the human heart. Oh, yes. And early on, the first clip we are going to hear was from an interview recorded on March 31st with Robert Battle, the artistic director of the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And I was just overtaken by how accessible these dancers were, made themselves as soon as the nation shut down. They wanted to share their movement, their dance, to find meaning in their art in a way that still connected them with others. So thinking all the way back to March, um, there had already been several videos from Ailey dancers. And coincidentally, when I spoke with Robert Battle, it was immediately following a very important anniversary for Ailey, which he'll talk about so we can listen. 
Well, it's the anniversary of the legendary first performance at 92nd Street Y for the founding and the beginning of the company. And here we are 62 years later. And the company started in unprecedented times on the cusp of the civil rights movement. And so we think it's fitting that we give access to our audiences, to new audiences who need some sense of hope. So that's why that date is important and today is so important. Yeah. Now, how will you celebrate? Well, we're starting this wonderful thing uh, called Ailey All Access. And this will be online streaming series featuring uh, performances of full-length works from the repertory, extension dance classes for everyone, original short films created by Ailey dancers and other specially created content. And this really, I think the dancers were really leaders on this because when they were called back from Dallas off the tour, we made the decision along with presenters to bring them home one of the newer dancers, Miranda, had this idea, and she was sort of basing it on the Brady Bunch, where you see them all in those different homes or wherever, but it's sort of all locked off. The little and squares on top the of little The little squares, screen. yeah. And so then Danica Paulus, who's in charge of a lot of our social media stuff, images and videos, they put together with a few dancers just the beginnings of revelations I've been Butte, dancing together. Their dogs were around them, their children. There was something of a statement about dancing alone together. And so that really inspired the organization to start this daily all access and use all aspects of the company from the main company, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, Ailey to our arts and education programs, our uh, Ailey School, Ailey Extension, and really try to do things that, that reach people where they are since the separation is so dire. And so that's really what it's about. And this company is, I think, poised to really take on this challenge because in the DNA of the company is the term accessibility. And for modern dance, that can be tricky. But this company has that wonderful ingredient of accessibility, a feeling that people can relate to what it is that we do. And so we're going to use that in this time to kind of act as a balm, act as an escape, act as some form of healing and feeding the soul wherever you are. I think it's remarkable that this was the end of March. And already these dancers had figured out a way to connect. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the wonder of technology that has enabled us to stay connected with each other. And also, if, if there is anyone in our viewing, it's not in the congregation, do I say, in our audience who has never seen Revelations. Do call it up because it's Alvin Ailey's signature piece and it is a revelation to experience. Um, so this was the end of March. Robert Battle mentioned having to call the dancers back from being on tour. We were very fortunate because late January was when they were in Atlanta. They've come to Atlanta every year since 1976. This is their second home. And it was, the next clip we're going to hear was actually from an interview I did in January, which was pre-pandemic, but I wanted to include it because it relates to something several months into the pandemic. 
there is a choreographer named Donald Byrd who created a work for Alvin Haley that is based on the Tulsa Race Massacre. I had never heard of it. I went to good Chicago public schools. We had history books, college, never, never heard about the Tulsa Race Massacre. And here's this choreographer creating this story. And well, I'll let you listen to him talk about it. That sounds good. Let's listen now and then come back and reflect on both of these clips. One thing to remember is that this was not an isolated incident. It was happening around the country. There's another famous one that happened two years later in Florida, as a matter of fact, where Robert and I are both from. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of shocking to me as well when I started to discover these things. And I think the reason that it's not in history books is because it was deliberately omitted and erased from the public consciousness by governments, by the, the news media, and so that it would people would not know about it. That was the intention. That was what was wanted, and that is exactly what happened. So all the more important that now you are providing this important lesson in American history yes. as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. I still could not wrap my brain around the fact that something this horrific in our history was not in our American history books. I don't know what it's like now. I hope it's better, but when I was growing up, there was nothing about Japanese Americans being interned in camps, in labor camps during the Second World War. It, it fit into that realm. And the government was the ultimate villain. Well, the ultimate villain, the villain, the villain was the hateful people who, who stormed this peaceful, beautiful neighborhood. But the reason I, I wanted to play that at was because in June, when Donald Trump was going to visit Tulsa for a rally on Juneteenth, no less, I was so grateful not only to have spoken with Donald Byrd and Robert Battle about this piece, but so grateful to have learned about it and through art. Lois, you have, you have stimulated so many thoughts in my mind. One is a, a series of books. Uh, Howard Zinn has been really helpful in lifting up stories that our history teachers never told us. That's one thing that all of us right now, whether we are my vintage or a younger, have a responsibility to be re-educated about what has happened in our country and the world, not only with one another, but also with the climate. And this business of having to unlearn what we were taught so that we can learn what is real and true. And then you bring in the third layer of doing it through the arts and how frequently that can outflank our cognitive defenses to be taught a truth through the arts, through dance and all of the other arts that you deal with. I wanted to just read from a note that I made of the first clip when Mr. Battle said, um, acceptability is what the arts are all about, is getting into your soul to accept something that it wouldn't otherwise accept. And that is about healing and feeding the soul. 
what a marvelous life mission to heal and feed the soul. Well, part of what's so extraordinary about this company and part of why I am profoundly grateful for my job is I have realized dancers are marvelous storytellers. Oh, yes. And I didn't know much about dance before I came to this job. I'd always loved Ailey, but mostly I was familiar with ballet through the orchestral scores for them. So it, it's just an ongoing source of wonder to have access to the likes of Robert Battle and his dancers and the superb dancers we have here in Atlanta. Yes, indeed. Well. well, before we go to our next clip, let's simply repeat what you'd said earlier. It's very possible to simply Google Revelations, the dance, and be treated to one of the world all time timeless classics. And also, I happened to have found on YouTube the, um, the, the stay at home renditions of these individuals. And it is, I, I, would, I would recommend everybody see the original revolution, revelations and then see the post pandemic or inter pandemic. Uh, revelation. It is it is something. But we have to go on because we have so many more wonders to talk about. Set us up for the next one. The next person we're going to hear is an Atlanta-based visual artist, primarily. He does interdisciplinary art, um, and he writes poetry. His name is Fahamu Peku, and his works are in major collections in, in the US and abroad. He, he's not only in museums, but a, a, a number of serious collectors own Fahamu's work. Much of what he addresses in his art is images of black masculinity, um, not only how it's portrayed, but how it's interpreted. And I wanted to speak with Fahamu early in June because um, after the killing of George Floyd, the reckoning that the world was having with racial injustice seemed exponentially greater than ever before. Yes. And I, I'm touched by the positivity that Fahamu expresses in this first part. Let's hear it like many people experienced a range of emotions and anxiety, uh, hope, frustration, joy, laughter, uh, you know, it's run the gamut. But ultimately, I'm very, very, very much encouraged in the awakening I think uh, is probably the most appropriate word, but the awakening that's happening um, around the country uh, and around the world um, as a result of these protests, as a result of this uprising. For me, you know, it's, it's been an interesting thing to see. It's, this is a subject that I've been addressing in my work for over 20 years. And to see so many people now responding and reacting and, and you know, seeking to engage is really encouraging. This was on June 9th, just a few days after George Floyd's murder. 
I would have expected more anger. Rage would be understandable. It reveals so much about the Hamu Peku and his soul. And later in the conversation, as we'll hear now, I asked him about the role of the artist in tragedy. Let's hear it. I think art is one of the most powerful vehicles for the types of social change that we are seeking. There's something to be said about the voice of the poet versus the voice of the politician, about the voice of the singer versus, you know, the voice of the, the civic leader or whatever you want to call them. Like, there's a way that art can communicate to us and communicate to our interior spaces that, you know, mere rhetoric cannot convey. And I, and I think that we, we have seen that over the course of these types of uh, civil and social justice movements throughout history. You know, when we think about the civil rights movement, you know, for as long as those campaigns were, were, were going on and you had, you know, quite eloquent speakers and, and representatives were behind, you know, podiums and pulpits and, you know, expressing the frustrations of, of people. But when James Brown started singing, I'm Black and I'm Proud, that connected to people in ways that, that go far beyond any speech. There's like in, in the last um, few years, we've seen a, a shift uh, amongst um, museums and galleries and, and within the art world to promote the work of artists who were active during the 60s and 70s, you know, and, and the power in those images, the power in those objects are just as resonant and just as powerful today as they were, you know, 40, 50 years ago. But it's because the language that art speaks is a language that goes beyond any particular country border or, you know, state border or, you know, whatever it may be. Like, even if you don't speak English, you can look at a painting of Wadsworth Jarrell and feel the power in it. You can understand Betty Sarr's uh, sculptures. You can get into the work of Hank Willis Thomas. You can go deeply into conversations with these artists without necessarily having the quote unquote right words uh, to say. And I think that makes art a, a powerful vehicle for these times. And I always say in the future, historians will tell what happened, but artists will tell how it felt. I'm in awe of that. I am too. I am too. I took deep notes because they will, <laughs> <laughs> what he's just said will preach. I mean, the whole notion that the voice of the artist, not the rhetorician, goes into our interior spaces. And that's where the most important transformation takes place, is in our interior spaces. And the language that art speaks, tell us how it felt. Yes. Oh. And I keep going back to the fact that this was in early June. So many of us were stunned by what was on the news with George Floyd's death. Here he talked about the awakening, feeling encouraged by it. I, I don't like to think I'm so negative or cynical, but I just am in disbelief that it takes such tragedy to bring about a reckoning. And it's not like these tragedies are new. Well, a friend of mine says, you are gonna learn what you need to learn. And it's your choice whether you're gonna learn it through joy or through suffering. And unfortunately, we're having to learn about this racial 
this systemic racist reckoning through suffering, and it is heart crushing. Thanks also for mentioning the word awakening there. It is such a biblical term. Uh, Hebrew scriptures talk about being a watchman, uh, being a watch person. And Jesus talks about waking up and staying awake. Um, being awake is really powerful. And I, I really appreciated Peku um, mentioning that. And thanks for mentioning it again. <laughs> Unfortunately, we better move on because we've got an, an embarrassment or cornucopia of riches here. <laughs> Okay, I believe the next clip we have is an Atlanta-born music producer. He's a Grammy Award-winning music producer and documentary filmmaker. He's also an author. He recently moved back to Atlanta from New York, but he made this marvelous documentary with the musician Arturo O'Farrell, whose work you may know. And the film was called Fandango or Fandango at the Border. It's about this particular form of Mexican folk music that actually predates Mexico. It, it's um, this very rich musical folk tradition, um, I think it was in the area of Veracruz. And Kabir Segal is the person we'll hear talk. <laughs> he and Arturo O'Farrell went to Veracruz, Mexico to film and record to document these Son Jaroche singers, musicians. And then the film culminates with this concert that has been taking place at the border wall. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Kabir explain more. This all began when I read about a librarian who started a music festival at the border between the United States and Mexico. He invited us to join him to sing, perform, and dance. The librarian took us to Veracruz, Mexico to meet the masters of this mystical tradition. This is not just a story. It's a vision of a world full of hope, friendship, and love. This film looks at the ideas of identity and immigration but it does it through the beautiful music of San Jorge music. So this is really a story of coming together, uh, music of jubilation. And we wanted to, to say, you know, there's another story when it comes to Mexico and, and the United States. It's not always a story of division and animosity and xenophobia. There's, a, there's a 200 year history where there's shared borders and friendships and families. So our project, Fandango at the Wall, this film looks at how uh, we have shared music between our countries. And so it follows my friend Arturo O'Farrell, who's an incredible New York musician, multi-Grammy awarding musician. He and I travel to Veracruz, Mexico to find the masters of this incredible mystical tradition, San Jorge music. And then we recruit them essentially and ask them to join us at a festival, a music festival at the border wall between Tijuana and San Diego. And we play a concert with musicians on both sides of the border and we transform this object, which is meant to divide us into one that unites us. I should add that Veracruz, this area where they traveled, and that is where San Jorge originated, um, apparently was a landing port for slave ships. So uh, absorbed into this wonderful musical tradition that goes back to the native peoples in what is now Mexico. 
was some African influence. And it is such an astonishing story of unity and, and how the sum can be made up of all of these great parts and everything that we bring to this magical thing called music. Um, I love it. I would like for um, us to play the second clip, if you're ready, Ed. Uh, here, yeah. Kabir talks about the culmination of the film, which is this concert at the border wall between Tijuana and San Diego. And we also wanted to bring this music to where I was living at the time, our hometown of New York. So we bring, we invite the Sonorich artist to a wonderful performance at Symphony Space in New York. And there's a reason we did this. At the border wall, at Tijuana, San Diego, the border wall is actually made out of kind of a mesh. And you can put your finger up to one of the little empty spaces and you can just touch fingertips or pinky tips with someone on the other side. And we, we started calling this the high pinky salute. So among the camera crew and everyone on the team, we would just give high pinky salutes to everyone. But we started to call this another term, which is the Fandango Doctrine, like foreign policy through art and foreign affairs through art. And so we wanted to bring the Fandango to different parts of the world. And so in New York, the film culminates in us performing a Fandango, having a great Fandango at the symphony space. That image, I, I encourage you all to watch this film. It is so very special, Fandango at the border. But that image of people just enthralled, swept up in the spirit of this gorgeous music and wanting to connect the pinky doctrine, the pinky high five or high pinky. Um, it, at once it's chilling and it, it's gorgeous. Um, I love that. Pardon? Go ahead. I, I, yeah. I interrupted you, go ahead. Oh, no, no. no. So I, I, love the, I love the high pinky salute as a image, an artistic image, a wonder-filled image. Favorite verb in that clip was transform because the arts and the wonder in art can, as he said, transform the wall from something that divides us into one that unites us. And that is such the need of the human family right now to oh. find ways to be united, not divided. And we have a headwind into which we are facing to do that. And at the same time, I feel a tailwind behind me saying, yes, the universe wants you to be an instrument of uniting, not dividing. So I really appreciated those two clips my friend Lois, that, those were really powerful. I'm very eager to Google and watch Fandango at the border. Yeah, it premiered on HBO and then it was featured at the Atlanta Film Festival. And I have to give a shout out to Chris oh. es Escobar for what he has done with that festival and all that it, it has provided our community. Uh, one more wondrous thing about my job. Yes. So then yes, the next, yes, yes. <laughs> the next thing we're going to hear is from Mark Kendall. Um, a bit of levity, I think, is in order now. And this levity is also uh, colored by a serious message 
But Mark Kendall is an Atlanta-based comedian and improv artist at Dad's Garage. Um, very well-trained actor. He studied at Northwestern, came back to Atlanta where he's from. And he just has this delightful, zany sense of humor that is never mean-spirited. But he has a way of being spot on about making his point. So we're going to hear Mark talking about a character he's created for this funny video a series that he released about systemic racism. Um, and his character's name is Craig. And so the idea is that Craig had LeBron James statues made years ago because he thought he was going to win the finals in a year that he ended up losing. And so he, he wasn't able to like unload these statues on any, anybody, but then he sees what's been happening with the Confederate monuments in a, you know, the summer renewed conversation around them. And so his suggestion is that you keep the Confederate statues exactly where they are, but then you build a bigger statue above it of LeBron James dunking on him. And so uh, we were able to collaborate with Chris Nick, who's a very gifted special effects person, and he was able to do the special effects for us, and he was he was amazing. Afraid of losing your Confederate monument? <laughs> well, I have a solution for you. Recontextualization. So your Confederate soldier can say right where it is, but then you build a bigger statue above it of LeBron James dunking on him. But where are you going to get a LeBron James statue? <laughs> Come on down to Craig's Bronze Bronze Bar. I'm so excited, I can't even remember my last name! In the summer of 2007, LeBron James was in the NBA Finals. I thought he was going to win, so I had over 700 bronze statues of him made. He ended up losing the series and I had nowhere to put the statues. Until now, how can I be so confident that people will go for something as crazy as this just to keep up some statues honoring traitors? It's simple. This is America, where we value white people's emotions over everything else. A Confederate statue standing on its own is a big thumbs up to racism, but a Confederate statue with LeBron James dunking on it? That's my movie pitch for Space Jam 3. Take what was once a meeting place for the Klan and turn it into a cuck, cuck, cuck clam. I live here. But white, it works on other forms of white mediocrity as well, like the last season of Game of Thrones. Purchase yours today. Just call 404-266-3333-7283. 7828837278694483787373622 We accept Visa, American Express, or reparations. We prefer reparations. Hey, I remember my last name is Jefferson. Hilarious. And it's so clever, so spot on. And yet, look, look at what he is able to convey to us while eliciting this laughter. Um, I asked Mark about that. Why comedy for such a serious subject? And I, I think we have what he said. You know, I think comedy is really helpful for a number of reasons. I mean, when I think about Confederate monuments, you know, in particular, I feel like they're being used to tell a story so that people have this emotional connection, you know, to the Confederacy. So then they grow up with those images and those stories and they kind of hold on to these racist beliefs, you know? And I feel like that's how a lot of us learn things is through stories, it's through narratives, it's through images and things like that. The thing that's nice about comedy is that you can go into a room or show someone a video, I guess in this case, to someone that has a view that maybe doesn't match up with your own, or you could show a video to a racist. And the thing that is cool about comedy is that if you can get them to laugh, usually laughter comes from a place of understanding, and those are perhaps maybe the beginning steps of someone you know, changing their mind. And not that my objective is to change people's minds per se, but as a means of having a conversation or starting conversations, I think that it's, it's useful. 
I think through something like comedy, it's just a powerful means of expression to communicate how you feel on something that to someone that may not otherwise understand it. I think in many ways, comedy can be more profound than drama, but um, I am a fan of Mel Brooks and a lot of silly kind of humor as well. But um, I think what Mark said about getting people in a room together who may not have the same political or social beliefs, um, but they can connect through laughter. I thought that was most powerful. It resonates very deeply with me for two reasons. I, I preached recently a sermon about the power of the word with throughout the biblical texts and how the prefix of C-O-M or C-O-N turns the root words into together or with. And that is actually, I'd never thought about this until I did the research for the sermon. That's actually the secret of comedy is you have comedies, <coughs> pardon me, you have comedies when people come together with other people and tragedies when they insist on isolation and thinking that their condition is the only person who's ever had that condition. And the other thing having to do with all of this, my friend Lois, is um, I wrote a book about how one can go to a, their love brain rather than their fear brain, which are really two different brains, and how playfulness is one of the quick direct avenues from a fear-based life to a love-based life. If you can simply become playful or let someone invite you into playfulness. I thought of that throughout those clips. Oh, I, I want to read your book. <laughs> I'll send you one. <laughs> oh, thank you. I think we're down to our final example. We are. Which, which was a very recent interview. Um, the actor Emily Blunt, her publicist contacted me to ask if I would be interested in speaking with Emily about her advocacy on behalf of treating those with stuttering disorders. What I learned was such a beautiful example of not only the power of art to help us overcome adversity, but also the difference a good teacher can make in a child's life. How a teacher can transform a child. Emily Blunt had such a debilitating stutter as a child. She was bullied. She, for the most part, she didn't speak in school. And she had a teacher who approached her and asked if she wanted to perform in the school play. And of course she couldn't answer. She just shook her head no. But he said to her, it requires putting on a funny accent. And that made a light bulb go on for this 11 year old child. Um, and she thought, well, maybe if it's not me, I can speak without stuttering. I'll let you listen to the rest. Well, I had this really extraordinary uh, teacher who I credit with being the first person who allowed for the record to stop skipping for me. And just an incredibly intuitive man and a kind man. And we were putting on a class play 
And I'd always wanted to do a class play and I'd always wanted to read my poem out in class and I wanted to do all of those things, but I felt I couldn't or I felt people would laugh at me, so I didn't. But this teacher said to me, would you like to be in the class play? And I said, no, I definitely don't wanna do that. And in fact, I don't think I was able to say that. So I just shook my head. And he said, well, I think you, sh I think you would be good because I've seen you outside and I've seen you messing around with your friends and doing silly voices and different accents. And he said, and I think you speak quite fluently when you do a silly voice. So why don't you just do it in a silly voice? which is sort of extraordinary coming from somebody who doesn't stutter to subconsciously understand that maybe when you do a different voice or you play somebody else, you're able to bypass it because you sort of leapfrog to different aspects or different parts of your brain. And whether it's a psychological freedom of freeing yourself from yourself and therefore being somebody else, and speaking fluently, even in a silly accent, which I'm sure it was a dreadful Northern English accent that I put on at the time, <laughs> but it was just a revelation to me because it just, I had never had that experience where I could speak fluently and consistently. So I think the idea of acting and particularly her baby step with acting in another character's accent or inflection, dialect, was safety. Mm. This wasn't her. Uh, this was that silly character. I can, I can inhabit that. It's, it's not me, it's not my speaking that I laugh at. But what she realized was how much she loved the other. And it was a turning point for her. And it was thanks to this teacher. Now, I think most of you are probably familiar with Emily Blunt. Probably her breakout role was in the movie, The Devil Wears Prada. She was Mary Poppins with Lin-Manuel Miranda. She is a versatile, wonderful actor who spends a tremendous amount of time as an advocate and working with this American Institute for Stuttering. There are only two offices. The first one was in New York. Atlanta has another office. And she actually came here in mid-November um, to meet masked <laughs> with parents and children because it's still so very important to her to connect with kids, to counsel parents, to help those afflicted with this disorder overcome the stigma and manage the disorder. She still struggles with it. In fact, she said that the most difficult thing for her to do is talk on the phone mm. if she has to identify herself. And she, she spoke how she gropes for fluency at Emily Blunt. The other thing she said is when she pitches ideas, I wondered about script reads for her. And she said, again, in, this, in the context of the script, there's safety, she's fine. If she wants to pitch an idea, another approach to the director or the writer, then she will find herself struggling with it. But all of this makes her that much more human. And to have not only an actor, but an actor of her popularity 
this committed to traveling, to meeting with parents and children through this American Institute for Stuttering, I think is absolutely stupendous. To be sure, to be sure, to be sure. You're um, the person with whom I spoke last Sunday about the matter of wonder, talked about one of his mentors saying that what you really need to do in life if you wanna help everybody else is to find what makes you come alive and do that. And it's as if she had this teacher, and I think all of us have these very strategically placed mentors in our lives who help us come alive. And part of coming alive is becoming a vehicle uh, through which wonder enters the world. You know, that uh, in my language, the presence of the transcendent or the divine enters the mundane. And then all mm. of a sudden you have the experience of wonder. Oh, beautifully put. When Emily and I spoke, um, I asked her about the young boy who was featured in some of Joe Biden's campaign videos. And um, I, I mentioned that. And <laughs> the director of the Atlanta Institute for Stuttering said, they have welcomed him. The kid has his own podcast. He has an agent now. And, um, it, you know, just what a marvelous success story that is, but I thought it revealed something wondrous about Joe Biden as a human being. When he hugged that little boy and um, we can't hug during COVID, but Emily coming to meet with people to talk with kids and parents and talk about some of the actors she brings along, people children recognize from television and movies. And um, well, I'll, let's let her talk about it. The fact that you can look at me, hopefully, and everyone from Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson and President-elect Joe Biden and anyone you want to look at and think, my goodness, that could be me. So you are not defined by your speech. You do not have to be defined by it. It is not who you are. It is part of who you are. Um, it, it makes me think of Shakespeare who wrote sweet are the uses of adversity. But it's not sweet for kids who are bullied, for anyone who is suffering. And one of the things Emily also said was, they tell kids to stop trying so hard. <laughs> In her glorious way, she just said, embrace your study. She tells kids, you are a marvelous stutterer as a way of having them embrace. It's part of who they are. But oh, I love that. James Earl Jones, I didn't know Winston Churchill was a stutterer. If you go to this website for the American Institute for Stuttering, they, they have this list of pretty much who's who in, you know, history, who stuttered, so. Love it, love it. Wow, so Lois, this has been so magnificent. What a journey we've been on. And we could stay together for another hour or two or three <laughs> or four talking about your life and your perspective of wonder. Um, 
you know, are there questions I haven't asked you? Do you do you want to say anything about what wonderment is doing in your life today? Or I know that you are full of wonder about how marvelous your job is and your whole vocation has been being a delivery system for wonder for <laughs> all of you. For a long, long time, it's just thrilling what you do. Uh, what else needs to be said before we say goodbye about wonder, my friend? Well, thank you. And two things. One, deeply personal. I was struck by the wonder of family love and romantic love. Our son and his fiance got married in an outdoor ceremony in late September for parents and siblings only, safely distanced. And it was originally going to be a traditional celebration, a big party and dinner in December, but they understood the perspective needed to uh, change their attitude and their relationship has brought such joy into our lives. Um, and that wedding was a wondrous moment. I also have to say, um, it's an ongoing source of wonder to me that my husband and I have been together in the house since March 20th, and I feel closer than ever before. Um, even though it takes many more hours to do my work from the kitchen table. So I'm in awe of that family love. And finally, if we can go back to the introduction from that fantastic harpist, Elizabeth Remy Johnson, December 16th marks the 250th birth anniversary of Beethoven. And to think how our lives have been so enriched through this man's work, through his genius. And that for much of his life, he was deaf and lived in this interior sound world. To me, that's wonderful, wondrous. It truly is. Thanks for um, kind of making my agenda for me for <laughs> The times when I uh, want to watch something late at night and I no longer want to read, um, to listen to Beethoven, to uh, go to the Fandango at the border, to watch Emily Blunt in Mary Poppins or Into the Woods. Um, all of these things that, I mean, this is what you do for us in Atlanta and beyond. You really do remind us that wonder is life giving. And for that, I'm so grateful to you. And I'm very grateful for your generous offering of this time to be with us at St. Luke's this morning and for people who will view it later on in December and into the next year. So it, thank you, my friend. Oh, it's such an honor and a privilege. Ed Bacon, you are wondrous. Oh, now you weren't supposed to bring me to tears. Well, I'm about to wish you a Merry Christmas and a very healthy, good new year. Thank you. And happy Hanukkah to you and a wonderful new year, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you for being with us, everyone. Uh, you can play this over and over and over again on YouTube, <laughs> on Facebook, on our website at St. Luke's. And always you can tune in to our friend Lois Reitzes in WABE for 
City Lights. Thanks for being with us.